Um, so tonight's going to be a little different. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about it quite a bit. Iceberg good. More um, iceberg. More good. Um, thank you. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate that. Um, so tonight's going to be a little different. Um, you know, it's group therapy night and, uh, usually we have, you know, more of the, um, sort of open discussion style. Um, every once in a while we'll have a topic, um, but it's, it's still usually related to just like a, around like a big, um, overarching theme. Um, that's just like day to day life stuff. Um, this is going to be a little bit different because this is a part of, this is an unfortunate part of day to day life for a lot of people that we don't talk about enough, I think. Um, and I'm not the best equipped to talk about it. So that's why I brought in, um, someone who knows way more about the subject than I do. Um, but tonight we are going to be talking about, um, male survivors of sexual assault. Um, so, um, my very, very dear friend, Andrea, uh, she's hip to be hippie in the chat. Um, she is here tonight and she's gonna, um, talk with us a lot. She's got, um, she's got some, some experience of her own that, um, Andrea, are you, you gonna, you gonna talk about that a little bit later or do you want to hold off on yeah, that? Yeah, do you want to talk about it now? What do you want to talk about? Where yeah. are you at? Yeah, you know what, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go into it and then let's, before we do, um, I'm gonna go ahead and let's put on the chill music because we are going to need it tonight. Um, so we are going to be talking about, um, you know, sexual abuse as a topic, statistics around it. Um, there will be, you know, anecdotes about it. Um, so if this is something that you cannot be here for, if this is something that causes you some kind of trauma related stress or whatever it may be, and you need to leave. I totally understand. Um, I I don't want this to be s more stressful on someone than it already has to be. Um, but for those of you who do stick around, there will be um, some stories about uh, these kind of things. So I just want to you know make sure that everybody's um, that they're mentally prepared for that going forward because we, we are going to be talking about that, um, a little bit tonight. Um, so if you need to go again, no hard feelings whatsoever. I totally understand. This is not a topic that everyone can listen to. And I understand, um, many, many of those reasons why, um, but, um, I do want to talk about it tonight because again, this is something that I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, this is a topic that you know, we, we don't, we don't talk about sexual abuse enough, uh, just in general, but we really don't talk about it from the perspective of, um, you know, male survivors of sexual assault. Um, and, uh, I want to kind of shed a little bit of light on that tonight because I think we really need to. So, um, uh, Andrew, you want to go ahead and, and, you know, kind of yeah. give your, your intro. Oh, we can, yeah, give my, give my intro and then we can actually start to have a conversation about some of this stuff and it'll just be you and me talking and I think that'll be fun. So, um, my background personally for everyone is um, about 10 years ago, I was living on a school bus in Tampa, Florida, and I had just finished renovations and someone broke in and attacked me. Um, a lot of my PTSD trauma is around the fact that someone tried to kill me more so than the fact that there was a rape involved. Um, and so after that, um, event, there were, and bear with me this is a story i haven't told in a long time when you are a survivor and going through the court system you often are able to tell your story over and over and over again because you are expected to um so i'm i'm a little rusty here um so um after i was attacked on the bus i was able to get away it was something that was because i was able to keep my head on me i was able to save my own life um ran and ended up 
flagging someone down and who went, happened to be a nurse and she called 911. Um, there are tapes of that out there somewhere, which are probably not fun to listen to. Um, but I think Zach and I are similar in that we can be straightforward in our communication. And so my brain managed to take over and just communicate the information that was needed. Um, went to a friend's house a couple of blocks away um, where I waited for cops to show up and it took about 30 minutes. Um, the story I came to understand later was that they wanted to finish their breakfast and that this wasn't a priority. They had assumed by the call that they had thought it had happened the night before. So that resulted in about a month of um, investigation to try and track this person down, which they did. Um, the credit of the detective on my case, who was wonderful. Um, and then from there, about six months later, we went to trial and he is in um, a, a federal prison, I believe in Miami at this point. So that's my background. And that's why I kind of got thrown into this world where there are a lot of stories to tell and I felt like I had a platform to at least talk about that. And I felt like that was important. Um, um, so, <laughs> yes, Zach? No, you go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. You go right ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm finished with my story. Yeah, I, I want to hear what, you, what your thoughts were. Um, so, uh, I remember that morning, um, I was... Uh, I was working for a construction company uh, that's actually right around the corner from my house. And, um, uh, you know, it was morning. I was kind of getting into my normal routine. And um, I looked and I saw, like, I started scrolling Twitter because uh, Andrea and I have been friends for, you know, many, many years now. And um, I saw that she had actually tweeted about it. And, like, I, like, I didn't know. I, I saw it. And like it, it registered, but I didn't know how to react to it um, because like she tweeted, you know, like it was basically what was it? So I, 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 I was just raped. I think it was like was was the the exact tweet. It was a dis it was a description of the um, rapist, and then. Um... I think it was mostly around the description because that was what I thought was important. Yeah. And um, like it started like it started out like it, it ended up being like a thread of just trying to get that information out so you would have it later, right? Yeah, I think it was more that I knew that there were a good amount of people in that area that were on Twitter that I was connected with that could be eyeballs. Um and I also felt like there was a community there. Yeah. Those are my friends. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, and, and the description ended up being accurate, which really helped me. But um, I tweeted that from the back of a cop car and they asked me to stop. They asked me to not engage on Twitter anymore, which I thought was a fair request. And I, I listened to it as soon as, as they um, made that a request of me. Yeah. I, um, I, I just remember like scrolling and like, I see like the first tweet about it and I, like I said, it, it registered to me, but I, I, like I had no idea, you know, like I just kind of sat and I just, I'm like, what, you know, what the hell do I, what am I, what do I do? What do I, what do I say? Like, I just, um, so like I just I kind of followed along because you know obviously I'm I'm nowhere nearby. This was you know miles and miles away from where I was. Um, so I I think I was just kind of floored by it, um, and just I I I didn't know I didn't know how to react. Um, Had we met at that point in time? Had we met face to face? I think so. Yeah, I think we had. Um, I think that was not long beforehand, but I think we had met at that point. Um, but yeah, that was um, just to, to to see that you know you've you're basically being alerted in real time that something so 
terrible has just happened to a friend of yours it's like it's 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 jarring to to say the least um yeah. and i like i i didn't i again i i don't i still don't even have the words to describe it now cuz i just i have no idea i had no idea what to what to do what to say um and so that's it was like and, and again this is this is somebody who's you know, from the outside, right, just looking in. Yeah, and you were, I think, you you took the right approach. Like, you listened, you were there, but you also did the follow-through support. Like, you were one of the friends that continued to stay in touch with me, and we communicated in our own way, and that follows through support and community is what makes a huge difference to survivors. Yeah. Like, the... There are studies that have, and of course, I'm just going to say studies broadly, right? I read the title of an article. Um, so studies that, that looked at um, veterans, especially those coming back from particularly horrific wars like the Vietnam War, and coming home to being spit on made the biggest difference in them being able to deal with PTSD and trauma and not. And so when you're talking about support, that's the most important thing is to have support from the people in your community. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I wanted Andrea to tell her story just so, you know, everyone else has a, an idea of her perspective, you know, where she's coming from. Um, you know, having lived through something like this, um, and you know, that really shaped the, the, the reason and the way that she's such a, you know, such a, a loud, um, proponent of survivorship now. Um, she likes to say she's very loud about it, which she's loud about a lot of things. I'm loud about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're loud about everything. And that's Andrea, what I love that about you. quiet human in the corner that never says anything or has any opinions. Right? Yes, that's me. That's what I appreciate about you. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I wanted her here because she's been, you know, so involved with, with the survivor community for the last 10 years. Um, you know, having gone through all of the process herself, go, having gone through the legal system, um, and, and working with other survivors. Don't recommend it. I mean, I do recommend it, but don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Recommend that you, you should report. Recommend the attempt. Don't recommend the actual experience of going through it. And... Uh, uh, recommend doing the right thing and protecting others, and um, even if it's hard for you. Yep, I'm. Yep, I agree. I absolutely agree. But we all know reporting's not easy. Right, and I've. It, Sorry, I've just I've been listening to some stuff lately on some podcasts that talked about like efforts to try to make the process of litigation less traumatic because it's really a re-trauma, you know, because you're having to complete you're having to relive your experience over and over again as you report and you report and you report. So, and yeah, yeah, it, it gets even worse when you get minors involved because you have to jump through hoops to be able to report and if you don't have support to report well the report goes nowhere yeah yeah um that's unfortunately that's very very true and very common um so i kind of wanted to to talk about statistics a little bit because we are talking about survivors but i wanted to focus a little bit on male survivors um because while you know we are we are progressively t having more and more conversations about you know how this affects women um and again it is predominantly women who are victims of sexual violence um men are still a big big chunk of that too um and there's um there's not nearly as much talk about it uh i think a, a lot of that has to do with 
a lot of the toxicity that we have in society based on, you know, what makes a man a man, um, toxic masculinity we've talked about before. Um, and I know that we've had problems with that as far as um, how it's shaped our society and how people respond and react to things. Um, perfect example, just like in Andrea's story, the police taking half an hour to respond to a rape and attempted murder because they were finishing their breakfast and it wasn't, they didn't deem it to be important. Um, so that's just, that's, that's a stalwart example of the kind of, of attitude that people have toward sexual assault victims to begin with. Um, and then you factor in, um, you know, when that victim is a man, you know, it's, it's, it's talk. I think it's talked about even less because people are afraid of the judgment that they'll, they'll face as a man, um, being a victim of sexual assault. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the statistics um, from Rain. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, I've put a link to Rain in the chat. Uh, Rain is the rape, abuse, and incest or rape, abuse, and incest um, national network. Sorry, I, it's it's a mouthful. Um, um, I worked for them for a while, and it took me a while to get that pitch down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Rain is one of the foremost organizations who um, provide support and advocate for um, victims and survivors of sexual violence. Um, so, looking through their statistics that they have, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in... Um, just because again, Andrea has got perspectives on this that not everyone does. Um, but have a, thoughts. yeah, <laughs> she has, she has very many thoughts and I want to hear them all. Um, according to rain, every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. So every minute, basically someone is sexually assaulted, um, which is just, like it's, that's horrifying to on its own um but to add on to that er, about every nine minutes that victim is a child someone under the age of 18 um the worst part about it is um about 25 of every 1000 perpetrators of sexual violence will end up in prison um and again that's there's a lot of factors that go into that um a really shitty criminal justice system um that doesn't advocate for survivors the way it should um people who you know don't report for whatever reason it may be um whether they don't do it out of fear whether they don't do it because they know that the system isn't on their side um, and, um, you know, getting into the system again, because of the way the system's designed it, that system ends up failing, you know, that victim, that survivor. Um, but I kind of wanted to break. Well, I think, yeah, one of the other important things to keep in mind is that I believe it's 19% and Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, um, percent of Actual assaults are committed by a stranger. Um, and so the majority of these people know the people who are attacking them. They could be living with them. They could be, that could be the, your source of a roof over your head for you and your child. Yeah. What are you going to do? Like sometimes it seems very cut and dry of, well, of course you report and of course you, you know, you take the risk, but there's a lot more at risk for a lot of people. Um, yeah. here that we don't always recognize. Um, and I think we've all taken time this year to think about the systems that are in place and if they're the right systems. And I, I think this one is one of those ones that's not. Ha there are bigger issues here that touch on a lot of other things. Yeah. Um, and you were right on that statistic. It's 19.5% it's of all sexual violence acts are committed by a stranger, which means roughly 8 out of 10 are committed by people that the the victim knows 
So whether that's, I, you know, whether that's a, an acquaintance or a friend, whether that's, you know, a partner or a spouse, um, a, a relative, whatever that may be, it's, you know, eight out of 10 roughly is someone the victim knows. And I do not recommend telling people that if you're an expert in anything, it's rape because that does not get the response you, you want. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've done that before. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so yeah, like these, these are complicated things. And I think one of the things that we wanted to, uh, that I know we wanted to talk about was these statistics and how accurate are they? Um, when you're looking at rain statistics, the accuracy of the data collected or the who are you going to go to for facts about these and studies about these? It's definitely rain. They are the most um, they're the most qualified. I would say as someone who has told her story many times, the is it one in six? Is that what it says for females? Yeah, one in six, one out of every six women. Yep. And that's Am I, I'm allowed to swear, right? Yeah, whatever okay. whatever you want. Yeah, fuck. This is for adults only? Yeah, that's fucking bullshit. There's no way it's that that low. Um, I can tell you every time I tell my story, the person, especially when it's a woman, looks back at me and tells me her own story. Um, there, for a while, when I worked within these groups, the idea that I was just collecting these horrific stories about people was a huge part of it because people turn around from you go to a, um one of these events to support good causes but the focus is about rape and survivor and everyone tells their story and so there's a point where you've just collected all of these horrible stories that no one wants to collect but it's everyone or it's most people yeah yeah so, um, and I'm glad you, you brought up the breakdown. Um, so, again, as Andrea said, according to RAIN statistics, um, it's one out of every six American women has been the victim of either an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. Um, s however, there's still an overwhelming statistic of men um, so about 3% of American men, um, that's one in 33, um, but about 3% of American men have experienced an attempted or completed rape in their lifetime. Um, so th that puts about nine out of every 10 victims is female, uh, or are female. Um, but that's still, you know, roughly 10% of victims are male. Um, and so I also important qualifier, uh, 3% of reported, uh, reported survivors. Yes. So you're talking like, these are reported numbers. These are people that are coming forward and saying that this happened to me. Yeah. And that's why that 3% is even worse than the one in six. Yeah. There's no way that's accurate. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, we've, again, I, I, I also think it's bullshit. I think the numbers are a lot higher, um, for both women and men. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm convinced that the, the, the number of men has to be higher. Um, so to kind of give you, you all a little bit of my perspective, um, so I was about, I don't want to, I don't know, like nine or 10 years old, maybe, maybe not even, maybe, yeah, somewhere between like eight and 10. Um, I don't, I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, and I went to a summer camp, um, for about, I want to say it was like a week long camp. Um, uh, it was a church camp and um we were going to the bunks to go shower before dinner i think and so you know there was only a couple of showers in the the cabin so we were taking turns and at one point 
I was laying on my bunk on my on like the bed. Um, they were basically cots laid out because it was just a little camp out in the woods. Um, and there was this group of boys, and um, I think there were three of them. Um, but I remember, you know, a couple of them coming over and holding me down while one of them jumped up on top of me with no pants on and like I don't know whether he was playing around or he was like actually making an attempt but he acted like he was trying to put his penis in my mouth um and um you know the it didn't he he wasn't able to do it um and you know at the again at the time i thought well you know it didn't it didn't happen it wasn't a big deal um you know who am i going to tell about this cuz i'm not home i'm my you know my parents are nowhere to be found um and so i you know i just never said anything about it um so you know obviously it never got reported it was it was never a thing um so you know i i just i i found out years later um that my mom had been sexually assaulted by her older brother um and it's just you know it that that's kind of when it sort of hit me like when i found that out it's like wow this is this really is just a grossly common thing like it's just terribly common for this to happen um and you know again it was years later that i learned that about my mom um and it you know after a while it finally registered to me that um you know this was you know essentially the same you know category of shit that happened to me and um again it, it was it's kind of those one of the the more rare statistics where it was just some strangers some kids i had no idea who the hell they were um but it it's you know again i never told anybody cuz i just told myself that it wasn't a big deal and i don't need to say anything about it um and so that's that's kind of why i'm i'm in the same boat as andrea i'm i think these statistics are absolute horseshit um only because we don't know you know and it's it's i i think they're a lot higher just simply because people don't come forward people aren't able to come forward um so i just yeah i'm i'm with you on that andrea i i'm i I think the statistics are a lot higher. 100%. I can't speak as much to the male survivor side of it, but I've, my, me and my friends have actually talked about this and we've never been able to come up with six where there's only one. Like, there, we've never been able to come up with a group of yeah. six of us where there's only one. Like, I mean, yes, it's still anecdotal, but it's just like, this is several different groups of friends over decades. It's not anecdotal. I think at some point, it's it's repetitive data. It's seeing it over and over and over again. Um, and Zach, like, thank you for be being honest and like talking about it now, because it isn't always easy to bring it back up, and it isn't always easy to like be open and honest about it because it sucks. It's hard. It's not like a fun topic you want to talk about. And it plays a big piece in a lot of our mental health. And be, like that honesty piece to me is so important to moving us all forward. Because if everyone thinks it's 3%, no one's going to do anything about it. Yep. When it's 97%, there might be a point where there's just a, wait a minute, something's not right here. We need to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so the first step to that is being open and honest with each other. Because if survivors feel like they have a community to be a part of or some sort of support system, then they're going to report more because that community makes you feel safe. And 
we have to help each other by being honest and that's the only way to do that is to to tell each other that also happened to me and yeah i think just like being honest about it is so important and helpful so it's nice to have another voice here i i want to i want to play the video that you sent me um it's a less than a minute clip um but it's from a a talk show where um there's Mm. a guy who's explaining um you know what happened to him um he was in a sexually abusive uh relationship and um just the audience's reaction um i think is one of those it's it underscores why men don't come forward nearly as much. Um, so I'm gonna let me see if I can get this to play. Uh, let's see if I can get it to. There we go. Okay. So, and that's. And the, like that that's you know and and you can see you know just the like hearing the audience reaction to it like he's talking about you know being locked in and having to escape like having to jump off of a balcony to 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 get away from this abusive relationship he ends up in the hospital because he's injured himself so badly and the audience is laughing at it like it's it's just it's you know that's 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 the nightmare that i think anybody has but you know that's the kind of typical reaction that you you know you get as a as a as a guy um, because it's like well you know well you're bigger than her you're stronger than her or whatever excuse they want to come up with um, you know you when you're not in that situation when you're not in that scenario you can't make that determination you can't make that call for someone else there's no way there's no way that you know what that person's situation is, what they're going through. And just to, you know, to, to be, to be laughed off like that. And, you know, I think that's, that's a nightmare for a lot of people. Um, and again, it kind of, especially coming from, you know, being a guy who's a, a victim of something like that. When you, when you go to someone and, you know, like you're speaking out about it and you're the, the first reaction is this entire, um, you know, studio full of people who are laughing it off. Like that's what, what's, what's, why would you, why, why would any guy want to, to, you know, go through that? And why would they want to report that? Why would they want to say anything to anyone about that? You know, just to be laughed off. So, um, yeah. And I, I think there's the difference too, between the, the laughing in someone's face and the laughing that happens behind the the scenes like there's two different there's there's one thing to be feel like you're being mocked on stage or to your face but i think there's also a subtlety of of feeling like you might be being mocked behind closed doors whether it's an open and more accepted thing like i think there's still going to be an undercurrent of not of that toxic masculinity or whatever we want to call it that might be a little bit playing a piece here and i think it's going to take a while for that to go away because there's probably still people who don't uh, that don't think that like women complaining about this is an issue right like then we're going to talk add an extra layer and people get frustrated but like we've talked about we have to move forward together this is a we situation and male and female and every like survivors are survivors and that's why we continue to talk about it so that we can help each other yeah um so you know we've talked about some of the general statistics around the victims some of the statistics around the perpetrators um but i want to talk about the the criminal justice system a little bit too um because there it has its own spectrum of of problems um you know going back to the statistics of you know of the the actual assailants themselves um you know again 
going going by rain statistics um, in jail or prison, uh, about sixty percent of all sexual violence against inmates is perpetrated by the staff, not by other inmates. So there's more sexual violence being committed by the staff, the guards, whoever is working in the actual institution than by other inmates. Um, and that's just like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck? It's partially because there's a power thing there. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's partially about power. And that's where that dynamic can play into peace because it's, it might be an expression of, of frustration, but wanting to be in control or in, in power. And so that's where that's, that's why that happens. I, I think I'm sure there are many more smarter people have done studies and things but yeah um and then you know talking about reporting um like the statistics around reporting like even just looking at the ratios is it's it's it deters people from reporting um so out of every thousand um sexual assaults only about a little over 300 of them are reported okay so we're down to less than a third already. Of those 310 reports, about 50 of those lead to an arrest. So you're looking at one in six of reports will lead to an arrest. 28 of those 50 will lead to a felony conviction. And then 25 of those will end up actually in prison or jail for it. So half of the arrests, only about half of the arrests actually lead to a a prison sentence but when you distill it all down that means that out of every 1,000 every 1,000 sexual assaults 25 of them two and a half percent actually lead to prison time for someone committing the actual assault um, and I mean that's just I would love to see t statistics on um like wealth distribution yeah that. yeah because I would, too. I would guess that it changes proportionally based on how much money that you make i'm i guarantee that it does i i honestly think that male survivors also have a harder time with the reporting because i've heard a couple situations just from people i've known that that because it's people they've known they've had the threat of if you report me i'm gonna say that you raped me instead which is not necessarily as co common of a counterclaim for women to have to get past that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So on top of the, all the typical burdens of reporting, having anyone believe you or listen to you or anything, you, especially if it's someone, you know, and you're in an abusive, toxic relationship, you have the counterclaim of ice bear needs it for everyday hustle. Well, I'm just going to say that you raped me and now you've got a whole mess. Oh, wow. Thank you for all those gifted subs, Wagner. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um. But I was even thinking, too, like, I think, what was his his dumb face? Brock, what's his face? Like, I think, too, age has a lot to do with it because they tend to look at the younger ones as, oh, well, we don't want to ruin their future. And that doesn't negate the fact that they've done something and in some cases will reoffend. Um, I don't know. I think that sometimes plays a factor in how they look at some of these cases too. Yeah. And I mean, it's, yeah, it, 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 it goes back to what Andrea said about, you know, different statistics. And I think part of that, um, you know, income factors into that and race factors into that a lot too. I mean, Again, we look at criminal justice statistics for broken down by race, and you'll see a lot of, of parallels um, for sexual assault specifically. And it's just, you know, the like convictions versus non convictions. I, I think the it, it depends on where the the wealth and the power is because it takes wealth 
to take the time out to pursue an investigation to an extent. Not necessarily you have to be independently wealthy, but you have to be able to take a day off your job to go do the investigation things. You have to be able to, you know, go down to the police station. And if you don't have transportation or you don't, ha you can't take that day off work, you know, does it even end up going anywhere? And where, it, you know, um, if, if the victim's you know, has a more, has more support system, has more wealth behind it, they may have an opportunity to, to pursue something where a, a poor victim won't. And I mean, if you go back and we talk about, you know, the reporting statistics again, um, uh, that that's another reason right there why people don't report to begin with is because you have people that are in a situation where, you know, they're dependent on this other person um, and a lot of times there, there may also be children involved where, you know, you have a person who's, who them and their children are financially dependent on another person for, you know, for shelter, for food, um, for, for basic necessities. And, you know, there's the fear that, you know, not even getting to, to the point to, to being able to, to fight it, but the getting to the point to, you know, to reporting it, like, if you report that person and something does happen to them, then what are you going to do? What are your, what are you, how are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to take care of your children? Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that, that factors in across the board. I also think there's a, like, you have to create a better system of record for bad people. <laughs> like, like, uh, I knew someone who was getting a restraining order on someone and they were like, I am so lucky that I have a job in tech that is like that when you say I need a half day, I just am going to be gone. They're like, cool, we'll handle it. Um, and she was like, I feel like I'm even pushing the limits of what I'm allowed to do to get this thing handled. And she ran into a couple of women who were there who are like, this is my third time. And he basically like didn't show up. So I have to figure out a way to like get another babysitter for my kids and get on the bus and get down here and take a day off from my job. And like, if it's easier to report those little things along the way, then we can start to understand what people are going to be assholes. Yeah. Like, there's, it's not the first, the first time someone who has raped someone goes to jail. It is not their first time doing this. Yeah. Rarely, I would imagine. Well, I mean, again, going back to the the rain statistics out of every thousand suspected perpetrators 370 have at least one prior felony conviction it, so over a third of them all have already been convicted of a felony prior to the prior to them you know being called in on a rape charge like that's yeah 10 percent of them have five or more Ask the fun question of nature or nurture. Like, is this a product of being in a... Sh can this be the product of being in a shitty environment? Or is this... People are going to do that. Like, the people who are going to be rapists are going to be rapists. Yeah. Or is there a combination of the two? Yeah. I, I, anecdotally, I think that one's kind of a combination. I think you have those people who were... Gonna do that no matter what. But I... Abuse begets abuse in its own way i'm not not in an excusing or they're fine no you know, yeah. way but you know I, the even reality my own situation, even my own situation even my the people that my stories are from didn't have the greatest home life broken home life you know when your brain is developing and the environment around you isn't helping you understand what's the like what's a I don't know. It, they're not help. They're not feeding you with the information that's helpful, and so you end up, yes, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. <sighs> so let's, uh, Andrea. I kind of wanted to talk now. You know, you you've said you've worked a lot. You, you worked for Rain for for several years. Um, yeah. What? Um, so, go ahead. You want me, like I'll just I'll just talk about what we did because it was a really cool project. Um, 
I met a woman who worked for a company here in Seattle and we had both had our own experiences and had been more open about our own experiences and, and had just connected and she put together a um, benefit called Rain em In, which was us riding inflatable horses in Emerald Downs, which is the um, racetrack up here in Seattle for horses. And they were, we were the only group that they would allow on the field. And so in between these horse races, we would go out and do these inflatable horse races on these ridiculous um, inflatable horses because uh, she was just a creative human. Um, and so it was this really fun event that was supported by a lot of her friends and all of the money that we raised went to, I believe the funds that we uh, gave to Rain were allocated towards their military hotline. Uh, Rain has a dedicated military hotline to ensure that if someone from the military is reporting that they're receiving the support that they need from someone, I would imagine they can empathize with their situation a little bit better. Um, so that's where that money went there. Uh, so that's my experience with Rain. Um, There's a little bit of that interaction. Um, I always push people toward their website because they do a good job of covering everything and, and really bringing together a united front and also providing good statistics and information to people. Yeah. Um, and they also do provide support to victims, you know, trying to help get them out of a situation um, that they're in. I mean, uh, they have a they have a, an, a phone number that you can call here in the U.S. They have a live chat um, that you can access 24-7. Um, and that's fully staffed by volunteers, is it not, Andrea? Um, I believe they do have paid employees, but I'm sure that they're a 401C or 501C 501, or whatever 3C, those yeah. Are. Yeah. yeah. Those would be the numbers. Yep. Um, so let's see. The... So the rain number, and I will just I will just post it in the chat. Um, just if you know anyone, or you you know you need help yourself. Um, again, here in the U.S., that's Rain's phone number. And again, if you go to their website, that's their website. Um, you can you can. I think these phone numbers can kind of get misconstrued a little bit on like their purpose because. They're there to help. Like, if you are confused or, t like, have a story or are not feeling good about it, like, where you're at because of these past situations, like, those are resources that are meant to be used. Yep. This, and I know I, I am guilty of this as well as I think of that resource or, like, hotline as I am, I am at the end of my rope. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, emergency situation. And that doesn't necessarily have to be what that's used for, right? Like, there is support there for a reason. It is because that continued support before you get to the red flag zone of emergency <laughs> is there to help you through that. So please use that uh, phone number and hotline because it's, it's there to help you, even if you're not in an emergency situation. Yeah, and uh, like even on their website, they tell you, you know, if you're... Whether you're looking for that support, if you have a situation that you don't know how to get out of, if you're just looking for information, if you want to get more involved in being an advocate for survivors, like all of that, you can contact Rain through either their phone number or their website. They have a live chat um, and you can, you know, get connected with those folks and, and learn, you know, all the information that you need. Um now, again, I cannot stress this enough. If you are in a dangerous situation, please, please, please always dial your em your local emergency services first. That's not what this is for. This is not for an emergency situation where you are in imminent danger. If you are, I cannot stress this enough. Please contact your local authorities for that. Um, here in the U.S., dial 911. Um... Uh, I know in the UK it's 999. Um, if you if you have um, you know like again if you are in if if there's a threat of imminent danger, that is not what this is for. Um, now if again if you're if you're looking for resources or if you if you are it's triple zero in Australia. Okay, thank you, Dom. I appreciate that. Um, 
you know, again, if you if you don't know how to get out of that situation, you need to talk to someone about it. That's more what this is for. Um, or, or again, if you're just looking for information, um, if you're looking for, um, you know, ways that you can help, again, that's 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 what the Rain Hotline and website are for. Um, but if you are in, if you or someone that you know is in danger, please, please, please have them dial their local emergency services number. Um, like that's, that is not what Rain is for. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there so everyone's everyone knows and is aware. Um, so yeah. So we talked about rain. Yep. We talked about what else? What else are we talking about today? Is there anything on our list? So I I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, for, for anyone who's been through something like that or is wanting to help someone that they know who's been through something like that, um, you know, dealing with the trauma of it all, um, how to cope with that, what, you know, what next steps you should take, things like that. And again, you know, having your experience here is key because you have been through all of these processes before. You've been going through this for the last 10 years, so you know a lot about um, you know, the different options that people have and the different things right. that they can experience. So I just want to talk about that some. I don't know if I would necessarily suggest cutting all ties with every single human you know and moving across the country. I don't think that's the best step to take, mm -hmm. um, but that's the step I took. So um, that's I, I think we've talked about community a little bit, and, and that's where that was important and I dropped the ball on that because I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, so I think one of the things that was super important and I've heard this from other friends is be consistent with them. Be, be who you were before this. Be their friend. They're just so hard to manage everyone else's emotions around you. And you're just trying to like survive yourself and you don't know what's next and you're so overwhelmed and confused and exhausted and to have to tell someone over and over again or to check with you are you okay is this okay it's like i need you to be the way that we were i need us to be those friends that will take my mind off stuff and i i oh, one of my friends once told me like i that she appreciated one of her friends because her friend would still check with her to see if she was busy which seems like such a tiny thing, but when you're locked in your basement because you're afraid to leave the house, you aren't busy and your friends know that. But that simple question, like that simple act of asking and keeping some normalcy yep. to all the fucked up shit you're going through yep. is so important. Like, I, you just have to be there like a friend and... Sometimes people are gonna, like, I'm certain that, like, I probably wouldn't have been a great person to be around. I probably would have, like, it probably would have really been hard to be a regular human in my life at that point. But I probably could have heard it from someone like, yo, Andrea, just, like, cut the shit. Like, stop. Like, don't do this. Because it, the recovery period was a long time when I was by myself and there have definitely been steps to that recovery period. Yeah. I, but I think, you know, in your situation, cause I, you know, I mean, you know, you and I have, we've, we've always communicated really closely. Um, especially with everything that was going on, um, when you had the court trial and everything going on in, in your life. Um, and uh, like, I, I, I got to tell you, like just kind of watching everything happen and watching the way that you handled it all. Like I'm, I'm, I, I, I obviously, I don't know what it was like to be in your own head during all of that. No one knows that, but you, but I got to tell you just like, no one, no one should be in my head. No one should be in mine either. Um, <laughs> but like just watching, watching the way that you went through everything like just the way that you handled it i like i was i was i was amazed and i was just absolutely just floored by the way that you just you took everything and you you were able to 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 handle it and i know 
that behind the scenes there was a lot of of not taking things well at times because th that's the nature of the beast and you and i have talked about this stuff before you know just the two of us but like um, just just watching you, you you talk about you know being the person that you were before like i i i didn't see like a a like a major change in you uh, because of it like you you were able to to maintain you know you you were able to maintain your own sense of normalcy while dealing with all of this other just absolute utter horseshit around you and like yeah. i'm i'm i was i was i that that's amazing to me like i'm oh, I, well, it's it's incredibly inspiring and yeah i mean thank you it means so much coming from you but it's it's also one of those things that's really hard to look back on and feel like it wasn't just the way that you what else are you gonna do like what was the other option i lay down and just give up and die i mean yes that was felt like an option but like it well, had to go into survivor mode yeah and you do and like that's there just isn't any other option and you just survive but i think looking at how long that took me after the initial three months of not leaving the house which is probably what it was and then the three years behind that and then to just kind of slow crawl back to some sort of normal like it took longer than it felt like it should yeah but you can't rush that stuff no absolutely not that's how you screw things up yep and i mean i know it, just like with any kind of recovery from anything um it sounds cliche but it truly is something that you have to take one day at a time like you take care of you you come in it's like okay today i feel this these are the things that i need to get uh, get done let's get through today and we'll deal with tomorrow when tomorrow comes so yeah it teaches you a lot about how to do that um try and get through that stuff um i i I think this pandemic has been interesting to watch from someone with experience with trauma and watching the patterns unfold and seeing the same things and uh i sometimes feel like i'm the only one who can see it <laughs> yeah so and that's that's something else that i kind of want to talk about i'm glad you brought up the the pandemic um oh um gene if you would like if you would like to share on voice, you are more than welcome to get on. You don't have to. You absolutely do not have to. If you would just like to share in the chat, you can. But if you would like to get on voice, if you come into the Discord, I actually have a stream chat lobby, and I can pull you in it whenever you feel that you are ready. Um, so uh, if you want to jump or in. Or you can just jump in or listen. Yep. Yeah. What, what, whatever, whatever you you feel is 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 best for you um again no pressure but um i if if you would like to share i am i'm more than more than happy for you to share um so um yeah i'm glad you brought up the pandemic because that's something that i wanted to talk to you specifically about um so you know i know you 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 are a you're an introverted person, you know, you need your, you need your space and your downtime. Um, but mm -hmm. you still like, you're an introvert in so much as like, you don't need, you don't want direct contact with people, but you still like to be able to observe people like from your own little perch kind of, um, uh, meow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, you, you, you much like Elena are a cat and you will, you will give affection on your terms. And other than that, get the fuck away from me. Um, uh -huh. um, but you know, I, I know this has been particularly hard for you, you know, just with everything coming up. Um, you know, I know anytime there's an anniversary of a, um, uh -oh. of, of, of an event like this, you know, it it does bring back a lot of it, it. You kind of play that kind of stuff all over again. 
Um, My poor manager today had to sit through me crying on the phone and being like, it's fine. You guys are great. You're doing everything right. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing, like through tears where I'm like, it's I know it's just going to be a heavy week and there's nothing I can do about it. And so we're just going to cry through it because what else am I going to (laughs) do? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So like this pandemic has just been me uh also background i uh live by myself i love living by myself me and my cat my cat gets to be too much sometimes and she is a very independent kitten so i'm a very big introvert and this year has been very hard um to be by myself all of the time and the anniversary that zach is mentioning is that my 10 year anniversary of being attacked and raped in my bus is um coming up i celebrate it as the friday before memorial day weekend um that's when it happened but i don't keep a date it's more of a marker uh so usually that weekend i do say, it used to be thank god i'm alive weekend but who, who needs god so thank fuck i'm alive weekend and um that's when i celebrate all of that stuff and just the idea of life and i let myself do whatever i want yep it's lovely and I mean, it's... You so know, there's a lot of things... Uh, oh, go ahead, Zach. You go right ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. I thought I was finished, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, when we're talking about piling things on top of each other, like, my birthday is uh, two weeks before that exactly. I got my second shot on my birthday, which is awesome, but that means I'll be fully vaccinated on the 28th. So I'm going to be able to see people for the first time in a year and a half. And uh, yeah, then, and I'm going to pile that on this weekend with everything, like on that weekend with everything else. And (laughs) it just feels like it might go bad. Yeah. That's why we keep in mind those dates and we remember that dates are important and have meaning. Yep, absolutely for sure, and that's uh, that's also you talk about you know you talked about a lot com- about community, and you know keeping those people near you that are your support system. You know those are those are your people that keep you grounded, that keep you focused on you know on the the good stuff, um, and they're there for you when you need to to deal with the bad stuff, um, and that's you know it's it's really really important to you know and and i know not everybody is is able to but to have um to have you know people surrounding you um that can provide that sort of support system for you you know um like i'm they can be ready when i warn them okay i might just randomly burst into tears and then like just be gone for an hour it's fine i just left uh, don't worry about it. Yep, and <laughs> and you know to have to have people that that take that and acknowledge it and just we just keep on trucking and we we will deal with that when the time comes, you know. <laughs> um, but it's 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 always you know really really wonderful when you know that you have those kind of people in your life. Um, you know, just yes. Yeah, sh- shout shout out to Twitter on that too. Also true. Um, you know, I've, I've, the most important people in my life I have met on Twitter, um, um, either directly or indirectly, like Sabrina, Sabrina, I met on Twitter, um, through a friend of mine, through an old roommate, but still I met her on Twitter. That's the first interaction I had with her. Um, Tom, my best friend in the whole world, met him on Twitter. We first met in person at a tweet up back when that was a thing, you know, can we bring those back, please. Uh, I'm probably, um, and then, uh, and then again, Andrea and I we met on Twitter, and then we met in real life when I was like just doing social media shit back in like the like the early um, like 2010, 2011. Um, oh, you mean Startup Weekend when startup we first weekend. met in real life? Yep, at the Microsoft we offices here in Tampa. We yep. the biggest bear hug, and we—I thought we had never met in real life, but I think we may have. I don't think. No, I think yeah. that was it. I think that was. I think that was the first time because, like, I remember walking. That was in, after. Was it? It was. 
because I remember it very distinctly. Hmm. Listen, I'm old. I and don't remember things. And it was probably it was probably Susie's birthday. Oh, Susie's throwback. birthday! Wow. Yeah, that's. I think it was the twenty eighth. Wow, that's that's a completely different topic altogether. Um, I know. Uh, but yeah, so um, you know, m most of the, like the, the the most important people in my life um, that I've had around for any like length of time, I have met via Twitter. Um, again, either directly or indirectly. And like that's where I maintain most of my communication. If I'm if I'm not on stream and I'm not replying to people in the Discord or like on on chat with people in Discord, I'm shit posting on Twitter, but with my friends. Um, so that's you know it's it's it can it can be a great place to to find people and. And cultural relationships with really good people. For all of the garbage that's on Twitter, there are some amazing people there too. Don't feed the trolls, and you'll be fine. Don't feed the trolls, just like you, anywhere else. You might, you might accidentally find your spouse. It's that true. is the dream. It's true. I'm jealous of both of you. It's true. Yep, it's it's happened. It's happened more than once, hasn't it, Allison? Dream. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's so cute. Yeah. And then you find the person to, you know, to perform the ceremony, and then they come and perform the ceremony, or the, the then you know you go perform the ceremony for them a couple years later, and they come hang out with the wife that they met on Twitter. You know, it's it's yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It's you know, all that good stuff. Yep. But I, I think we do, you know, for for all the the terrible shit that the internet is being used for. I mean, you know, I talk about Twitter, but I mean, here I am on Twitch. Um, I'm coming up in about three or four days. I want to say, I think Friday might be, let me look. I think Friday might be six months since I started streaming. Um... And just like the people that I have met in that time, it's just like incredible the people that I have met in that time. No, Sunday. Sunday will be Sunday will be six months um, since I started streaming, and I'm just again I've I've met some of you know some some very dear friends that way. Um, and, it's just you, you never know the people that you will meet, um, and how and how they will affect your lives. Um, and I'm I'm very very fortunate to have found and surrounded myself with a lot of really good people. Um, and you know, for any for any kind of um, for trauma or s stress or anxiety or whatever you know sort of flavor of that ick that you have to deal with having you know a, a support system like that is just it's been uh, invaluable and i mean you know we've well it makes you go ahead i'm sorry no it just makes you feel less alone in those things too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like you know kind of <sighs> This is going to sound weird. Kind of comforting in the sense that I'm sitting on a chat with other people who have had experiences, even though I haven't quite got to the point of telling my story ever. So, you know, it's one of those things where you're sitting there going, okay, these, these people understand when I have those crazy things going on in my head and I'm like, why, why are you doing this? And you realize you found the people that understand and it makes you feel a little more comfort. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And uh, yeah, again, I mean, I think that's, that's part of why it's so important for people to be able to safely come forward and tell their stories so that you know that you're not alone in these situations. You know that others are, you know, they, they, they do have similar experiences. Um, it's just knowing that you're not alone in a bad situation 
is always it's always been to me like the most comforting thing it's like you know this is this is a trash situation but hey at least i have other people that i know that can maybe put me in the right direction of how to fucking deal with something like this you know it it takes just an ounce of that oof the the gut punch of whatever whichever situation it is out to have a support system yeah it's like it takes just a little bit of that blow yeah yeah Zach, I don't know if I've ever talked about my rape buddy. <laughs> I don't think I don't think you and I have ever talked about that. No. <laughs> let's start with let's start about with the gallows humor situation because that's that's how this always comes out. Um, I had a woman who I knew from high school who had, um, who was raped, but in a a very, uh, our cases were very different. However, we were going through the same thing at the same time, and she had gone through a little bit more before me. And so she was able to just help me understand, A, it was someone to be kind of insane with, because we would do things like you have to be able to see the door. And like we would be able to go out and have at least some semblance of normal, because I knew she was watching the door from her site, seat in the booth, and I was watching mine. So there was like this comfort there in knowing that we could uh, help each other, but also commiserate on those things that we recognized weren't normal or okay. Um, but she also helped me prep for trial in a way that the overloaded criminal justice system where the people who were prosecuting my case left to do something stupid like 13 more cases that day. Um, like... She helped prep me a little bit for things like no is a complete answer, like a is a full answer. Stop. Like just saying no to the uh, cross uh, went on cross with the defense was a lifesaver that isn't coached in anyone. There's no one here to help someone who doesn't have any idea how to come to court. Help them through that. Like. When I went to go talk to my lawyer for the first time the day before trial, um, he reiterated not to wear anything that I would wear to a club, not to wear anything that my shoulders were showing. And I had been agonizing over what I would wear to court for months because I knew it had to be put together. It had to look nice, like, but not flash like I, it had to be it was important the way that I presented myself that day and so to hear that other survivors are not equipped with the ability to do that is frustrating and sucks to hear because from my perspective why would you dress anything else I would never wear like a club outfit to court but when it's the nice thing that you own and your world says that's nice then that's what you wear yeah Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that that help and support needs to be there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and um, yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> I know, and I never. <laughs> I know we've all talked about mental health and stuff, and I have pretty massive ADHD, and so you just never know if I'm like. <laughs> making any sense by the end of my sentence or if I've completely lost the thread entirely. <laughs> no, it, it makes perfect sense. It no. makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I understood too, because like I was just, as you were saying that, I was thinking about this whole, well, don't wear club wear and it just, it goes back to this stereotype of you, some, a victim did something to deserve and I'm like, I don't know, like, what? I mean, I understand that, yes, there are, there's a tire that you should wear to court, but then just the implication that you're going to come in in club wear, it feels like it's just mm. a step away from, I don't know, and maybe that's just I, me, I don't know. No, I totally, I totally see your point there, and I don't, I don't know where I got that from, I don't know if it was, like, said directly to me or what the quote was, I don't remember yeah. at this point, um, or where the origin was of that comment, um, but 
Yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize that when you're going to trial, you will be evaluated based on how you present yourself. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you want to make a statement at that point. There are six people, 12, six, I don't know, Florida, um, that are deciding whether or not the person who did something horrible to you is going to walk away or is going to go to prison for the rest of their life. And for that, I'm willing to do something like mm -hmm. change the way that I dress or get eyelash extensions, which was I did not do, but was recommended to me. What are the little things? If the system is so pushed against you, what are the things that you can do to ensure the fact that you're presenting yourself in a way that gives you some sort of advantage in a place where you may not have the upper hip foot, like you may not have footing that you think you do. And I, but yeah. I, and I guess I just come from a perspective of that just blows my mind that you have to think that way. It's not fair or right. Um, but unfortunately, no, you're right. Like that's how you will be perceived. And so you have to, you kind of have to play the game. Yep. And yeah. I think I'm incredibly lucky because that's how my brain works anyway. And so I'm already thinking through that stuff. I'm already aware of how I look mm -hmm. and how I'm being presented. And so that's already at the top of my mind. I may not be at the top of everyone else's mind. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg's terrible at dressing himself. We've all seen people that are terrible at dressing themselves and they think they're better and arrogant and that could play out in the same way, but it's not going to impact them the same as what the subject is that's important so yeah right. or, yeah sorry i didn't mean to cut you off oh you didn't i uh <laughs> i tried to start another sentence it didn't oh. need to be started i want to hear what you have to say <laughs> no i was just thinking too like you know you talked about like for you you were able to go into survivor mode but in a sense still keep your head and still be able to focus on the objective, which was to get the motherfucker in jail, right? But that's not the experience of every person who, ex you know, some people aren't able to hold on to their rational mind, especially, yeah. you know, depending on the situation, especially if it's some, if it's at a, you know, an example of somebody that they know that has done this to them. And so it just, it just, yep. you know, it's so awful to me to think of this as, you know, that's not being put into consideration a lot of times by these people who are in the box judging this situation. And if you don't have that advocate, that person that says, here's how you need to handle being in the witness stand, how at a disadvantage that can put mm -hmm. you and how at risk that can put your entire case and then to think that you went through the process of re-traumatizing yourself of going through that process the litigation process for it to not even be a fruitful process it just yeah it blows my and I mind think the, one of the really important things here that i think has become more important for me to call out is i have an immense amount of privilege around this this is something where um, I was able to get flown home on Memorial Day weekend out of Orlando because, like, because, because of, uh, you know, really, frankly, like, having financial freedom from my dad. Like, my dad was someone who was able to get me a flight at, at whatever it took to get me home. Um, he was able to put, like, I lived in a condo that he owned for like rent but not rent like very different things and i there was so much privilege there in the fact that i was able to go home do emdr therapy that weekend sleep for a week because i don't know what happened that week because that's all i did and be able to like figure out what to do from there and go back to Tampa, figure out my life, put stuff in order, and then fly home to live there. And not everyone has that opportunity. That is not most everyone's experience. The experience of being raped is typically, cool, this is now an extra thing on your plate. 
go back to work because you have to pay your bills and you're going to have to get through this on your own in addition to all the other shit life has already piled on top of you. And the only way to help that is to finance. I, I think money has to be the answer here of we support survivors with money and the ability to do the healing that they need to do. And unfortunately, the pushback there is going to be about how do you prove it? And, you know, what if there's misreporting to get funds and help or whatever? But there has to be some sort of support system there that comes from a place of, of financial backing so that survivors can get back on their feet and be productive and helpful members of society afterwards. Yeah. Because right now there's no support. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, talking about just these these specifics that you had to go through to prep just for your appearance at your trial, you know, I, I it's, and again, it's, it's, it comes back to these perceptions that we as a society have built up, you know, one, like one of the worst is so many people, they, they don't believe the victim. They, they don't believe the victim, you know? Like, and then, of course, the system is designed in such a way where the burden of proof is on the state, i.e. you, because you're the one who has filed these charges against your your perpetrator. So this, you know, it's all of this is on you. So you start out from a position of people don't believe you. And then there's all of these little tiny just built in cognitive biases that people have. It's like, well, if you're wearing something off the shoulder, you know, you, you get into the territory of like, well, if, if you didn't dress that way or if you didn't look like this or if you didn't do this particular thing and, you know, you talk about all those little tiny details that you have to, to do a certain way so that, you know, you actually, you know, have a chance at, at convicting the person who's done this to you. It sh it sucks. Yeah. Uh, and then you they... wonder why people don't report. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. It's just terrifying. Yep. Um, so many little things. So one other thing that I wanted to talk about, um, Andrea, you had mentioned, you know, sp specifically about dealing with trauma. You wanted to talk about the concept of a trauma shepherd and what that is and what that, oh, yeah. that kind of means to you. Um, yeah. And it was just, I think we touched on it a little bit before, but, um, and this goes around some stuff that I've just been considering at work and what empathy means like when we're, means when we're working in teams and how that can come become an uncommoditized commodity. <laughs> that was terrible. Don't listen to me. Um, becomes something that just isn't important because it can't be put in a spreadsheet and it can't be tracked. Um, and so when we're talking about that kind of stuff, one of the things that I noticed was that I was continually raising flags of I have concerns about either the amount that I'm seeing my coworkers work or um, I just had concerns and I felt like I was flagging those concerns a lot and one of the reasons was is I started to take um, and I'm I'm in a role where we are often on camera and so I'm often looking at my coworkers' faces and I started to see trauma there. I started to see exhaustion. I started to see what I think a lot of people have come to know the thousand yard stare where you're not there. And that is often just a big marker of someone who's been through some shit like Right after I went through all of the rape things that I was dealing with probably, you know, 10, nine years ago, I could easily pick someone who had been through shit out of a crowd. And I, I started to see that same sort of thing in people. And I started to become a little bit sad that I was the only one that could see it. And I didn't understand how I was supposed to become this trauma shepherd for all of these people that were experiencing trauma for the first time, which would be this pandemic, right? Um, and how I'm supposed to coach them through that when I'm not capable, like I am not, I should not be the person doing that. Um, but reminding them like when people would say, there are common phrases that are were often used. Um, oh, but I know other people have it worse. And reminding people 
that that discounts the way that you're feeling and that it doesn't matter if other people have it worse. It doesn't negate your feelings toward it. And people react differently to these things. Um, people are different sensitivities to different things. So the way you're feeling about something other people might perceive as small may be huge to you and so hard to overcome. And so this discounted language around the way that you were feeling felt like I needed to consistently remind people that that's not the case here and that your feelings are valid. And it just reached a point where I was like, why am I reminding people of this over and over again? And when did it become my job as someone who has experienced trauma to help them through that? Yeah. I think part of it's a society culture. We don't, as a society, deal with trauma well, if at all. Like, so much of society it, it it becomes it's the to to use a sci-fi phrase it's a somebody else's problem field like it just yeah you just don't like no one wants to deal with it no one wants to talk about it you know you ask how someone's doing but like in a bunch of society in a bunch of bunch of our culture you're not supposed to admit if anything's wrong it's just supposed to be oh it's fine like mm -hmm. it it's we don't have a social standard for I mean not that there should be a standard for dealing with trauma but we have no like anything about it you know we don't learn how to deal with it you just suddenly get slammed in the face with it at some point or someone you know does and you know it's just sucks mm -hmm. yeah well, and like, I know for me, it's a lot of, I denied myself a lot of healing for the longest time because I played into this whole, I didn't have it as bad as other people had it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of those things that I think we need to kind of help people rethink. I know that, so background, just for me, I worked at a a therapeutic boarding school and so I did periodically get trainings to better help understand how to work with my students who were dealing with uh, trauma and we had an amazing um, training by one of the therapists there one day who talked about how to handle and let the people who are experiencing the trauma to define their own trauma and so, you know, she put it in the category of for like a big T trauma. So capital T trauma or, you know, lowercase T trauma. What might be a capital T trauma for you may be a lower case T trauma for someone else. But that doesn't mean that you need to then gatekeep that for them. Each person needs to be able to define their trauma in a way that helps them cope and heal. And I think we kind of get in our own heads and we say, well, I've got to compare what I'm experiencing to other people and what they've experienced. And that's not helpful if you're doing it as a way to measure how well, how much you deserve in terms of your healing and your recovery. Um, and it's something, you know, sometimes I would have to talk to the students about, like, they would just feel like, I don't feel like I deserve this or I deserve that. And I'm like, it, it doesn't matter. You still went through something and it doesn't matter if it's the same or different. You still deserve to heal from that and to have, you know, learn how to cope with that. And so I just, I see that a lot and I've experienced that. And I, I know where you're coming from, where you see people, you know, that they've, are going through things they've been through things and they don't have the tools or the understanding to even identify the fact that they have experienced trauma like the day that i realized i experienced trauma i was like oh my gosh that was actually trauma because i had been telling myself for so long it wasn't as bad as other people experienced it wasn't real trauma you know, and yeah. again, I'm rambling, so. 
I'm not rambling. I, it happens so often. And I think that's part of the reason why it became a pattern over this pandemic was that I was seeing it over and over and over again and just seeing it in other people that couldn't identify it in themselves nor know what to do. And also watching it get exercised in different ways. Um, I think I had a lot of people that I work with that just doubled down on work, right? We're home. I'm stressed. I may as well do this. Whereas I do it in a different way. And so that reaction to trauma, watching that either be rewarded when I feel like there should have been um, stronger, like someone stepping in and saying you're working too much versus where I like kind of just shut down and had a really hard time with work because that's how I was reacting. I worked out a lot, but like that's how I deal with my stress. And so understanding and seeing those stress points and the way that they get exercised in different people and making sure that you're keeping an eye on those people that you know are stressed and if there are indicators of that help them yeah i've 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 kind of been guilty of um you know sort of comparing my experiences to other people um and i mean andrea you and i've we've talked about this in the last couple of weeks just leading up to all of this um, but like, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been worried. I've been worried a shit about doing this particular, um, topic because, you know, I, I wanted to, to talk about what happened to me and thankfully, you know, um, I, like I have a lot of things to be thankful for one. Um, it, it, it wasn't actually completed Two, um, it like it didn't trigger any kind of like stress response in me um to where it's not something that i have to deal with on a um on a regular basis um so i just you know i it, it's not something that really follows me it to this point at this point to me it's it's basically like it is an anecdote isn't it? it's it's an event that happened to me i acknowledge it but I don't have any like long-term things that I have to deal with from it. So I'm very thankful for it. Um, I understand that it's, it's, you know, I understand it's, it's something bad that happened. Um, but I don't have the, the sort of, you know, I didn't have the trauma response to it. Um, thankfully, um, and so that's for me. That's why I was I was very hesitant about um, a lot of this to begin with because I was sort of downplaying it to myself. Still, it's like, well, it's not a big deal. Like, you know, it's 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 it could have been worse. It's other people have it worse, and which is true. But I, you know, my experience is still my experience. You know, no one will have the exact same experience that I did. Details may be similar, but you know, this is um, it, 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 it's, it still happened, and it's still my thing that, that you know, it, whatever feelings or, or whatever I have about it, it's are still valid. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's still hard for me to not compare to other people because, again, you know, like I. You know, you talk about the privilege of having the resources to be able to fight all of your stuff, Andrea. You know, I have the privilege of, of, you know, being surrounded with enough positive people in my life um, that I can, you know, it, it wasn't something that that that, you know, affected me long term, and I could I could bounce back from it. So I just. Um, yeah, I again, I was I was really worried about that, but I you know th that doesn't necessarily invalidate my experience. It's just a different experience. Yeah, I've I've kind of call, can coined the term for it trauma or imposter syndrome for tra trauma over the years because it's just I've I've done the same thing with multiple different aspects of my trauma because you know while I'm not dead, you know it. That that's an easy one, you know. So it's just it, it it's like imposter syndrome for trauma, and it's it's stupid and it sucks. Yeah. Um. I I have a little trick that I use 
to combat this a little bit is I definitely pretend as if I'm talking to myself if I was someone that I cared about. So I picture someone I care about very much in my head saying the same things that I'm saying of it's not that bad. And of course, like, the person who loves your friends and you is going to, like, roar back and be like, no, motherfucker, like, shut up. It was bad. It did suck. And so sometimes pretending that I'm not... I don't have the voice inside my head as much as it is that I'm coaching someone else through it makes it a little bit easier to remember that it, it was, it was trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you pick a specific person, that's the same person every time that you really love, then it starts to really resonate. <laughs> I'm going to deprogram myself. If it kills me. <laughs> yeah. And, but I mean, I think that's, you know, that's part of sort of the 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 growth process is is you know kind of getting over those those i get pre-programmed ways that we respond to shit or you know and just say no this i i can do better and here's how i can do better and kind of forcing yourself to do that So, um, Gene, if you wanted to, if you wanted to get in on voice, you're more than welcome to. Um, I can, if you want to get in the stream chat lobby, I can pull you in. Um, we can, we can absolutely do that. Um, mm, I totally agree with that. Uh, last thing in the chat, I don't know how to pronounce. Zach, help me out. Zundeferon. Then Defron, um, the idea that you can uh, see, it, it makes it easier to help other people through it. it. It's like I can just see what, I've been through this, like I've seen what trauma looks like, I've seen the fallout. I can definitely help you figure out what you need, like when someone's close to me that's going through stuff. And I wouldn't have that ability without these experiences, that's for sure. Yeah, um, and that's uh, again. I think it kind of that's that's part of the reason why I I wanted to talk about this because, like, what happened to me, like in the grand scheme, affected me minimally in a bad way. Like, I had I had minimal um, problems later because of it. Um, but that's not the case for everyone. So, you know, even if we can move the needle a little bit and say, hey, you know, we talk about, you know, someone has had this experience, someone else has had this experience, and here's how, you know, here's how they got the help that they needed, here's how, you know, we can continue to help them in the future, and we just keep, you know, the more we talk about it, the more we normalize it, then I think the easier it becomes for us as a society to deal with these things and help each other deal with these things. Um, I also find it super helpful to be honest and open. Um, I know I'm especially, I've been especially honest and open with work about this because it's the only way for them to help me when I'm like, look, I'm not okay. But if you don't tell people you're not okay, then they can't help. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's for friends too. Like, Hey, I'm not doing okay. Like, Zach, can you just stream every night and then I'll just come visit you there and it'll be great. And then he's like, yes. And then that's what we do. Um, <laughs> so I think that that support is huge. Yeah. Gene, you're okay. Just, you're fine. You're perfectly fine. No, nothing to be sorry for. Um, uh, yeah, I am. Yeah, we can <laughs> go ahead go ahead i'm sorry go ahead um we can talk about long-term consequences too because i know we talked about adhd on this before and i have recently asked my doctor like what was the impact of ptsd and he was like i mean it definitely kicked off your adhd because my family is probably adhd but they're very high functioning and they've taken all this like nervous anxious energy and just use it to plow through shit and when that went away, like the way that I work, the way that I function, the way that my brain works, like 
changed. And so it's learning how to deal with a brain that has shifted from, which was, it's not to say that I didn't have ADHD before, um, but when we're talking about the um, uh, ADHD connection to PTSD in that fight or flight situation, like I have a really hard time focusing because my fight or flight is ticking off all the time. And that is part of that ADHD. So like, what are these long-term consequences for stuff like this? And how do we give people the ability and understanding to go through and like work through them? Because even I don't know what I'm going to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like Zondefron said, like having that support system is just like it's so critical to do that. And uh, it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about normalcy, you know, like part of that support system is having those people there. But also having those people like not necessarily over you, like, hey, are you okay? Is everything okay? But um, like just having that that's that sense of like routine and normal and everything is okay. Not like not like t- people telling you that things are going to be okay, but just like knowing that things are okay because they're just they're they're just normal. Like you can feel things being normal around you you have those people around you and everything is like you know the way it's supposed to be if that makes sense i think that makes sense zach i was just listening i i i liked your thought very much so i'm reading through first of all Jean, um, please, please don't apologize. Uh, like I'm thank you for sharing your story and your, you know, your perspective. Um, like that's, it's, you know, sharing is, is, it's telling people is difficult. Like that's, that's a very, very difficult first step for any of this. Like the first step in, in, in dealing with any of this is telling someone about it, you know? And I appreciate you taking the time to share that. Um, and just looking through, you know, your story here. Um, again, male to male sexual assault. Like, it's, again, it's more common than people think. Because as dudes, we don't talk about shit. Like, there, there are certain things we just don't talk about. And it's, it's, it's horse shit. And... Um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of in, in a similar boat where I had an experience and I didn't want to, you know, detract from someone else's. So I didn't want to really talk about it because it's, you know, other people have, you know, other shit that they need to deal with. Um, and I'm, my shit's not as important or whatever, but again if we don't talk about it then no one else is going to talk about it either like if no one's talking about it no one's talking about it and we can't deal with it if no one's talking about it um like Andrea was saying earlier when we were talking about the um um the um the statistics the reporting statistics you know those are based on numbers that we know but how much more is actually happening simply because people aren't able to talk about it because they don't think that someone's going to believe them. They don't, they don't know that someone's going to, you know, take them seriously or, or actually act on the information or, you know, the system will fail them or whatever it may be like sharing that experience, telling someone about it, that's a huge first step, and it's a scary step. Um, but again, that's kind of why I wanted to do this. Is I wanted us to 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 talk about it because you know there are uh, like we're we're so many of us here tonight have experiences with this. Um, we love Eugene. We love you very very much. We appreciate you. Um, so many people here tonight 
have had some kind of sexual assault experience. Um, and like the, the percentage of people here that, that it, it has affected directly is ridiculously high. It's disgustingly high. Um, and I think it's, it comes to failings that we have as a society where, again, we don't believe people who come forward. We don't actually, you know, prioritize justice for the victim. Um, we don't, you know, have the, the resources available to victims to, to seek recourse for this, to seek that justice. Um, you know, I, I'm, I am, I'm very, very, very thankful that like Andrea said, she has had the privileges that she's had, you know, she had, she's got a dad who was able to, to provide the resources, the financial resources that she needed to fight her battle and actually, you know, get the motherfucker locked up. Um, and so many people don't have that. So many people don't have the support system in place. Um, and I think the first big step of that is a lot of times, and I've said this before, and this is something that I talk about, not, not just in this context, but in general, is shutting your mouth and listening. Um, a buddy of mine at work, he's, he's joked in the past, but it's absolutely true. There's a reason that you have two ears and only one mouth. Um, you know, we need to listen to people. We need to believe people when they come forward. Like if, if, if living in a society where we just, you know, where people automatically cast doubt on someone when they say that they've had this experience, when someone has attacked them, what's the, then why, why will other people come forward? You know, and then that just, that permeates through society and people continue to, um, you know, people are continually assaulted because no one is willing to come forward because people don't believe them. It's just, it's, it sucks. It's garbage. And so again, that's, that's kind of why I wanted to, to, to do this tonight is to, you know, kind of do a little bit, whatever I could, to push that forward where I could. Um, if, you know, if, if anybody else um, would like to share anything or if you have anything that you would like to share in the future, whether it's on this topic or anything else, whatever you would like, um, you're more than welcome to come share. Um, that's the That was kind of the whole idea behind Group Therapy Night is this is a place where we can all come together. We can talk about the things that we're struggling with, the things that are on our minds, even if it's just like the everyday little things, because the little things do add up. Um, and then again, you have no idea what other shit people are carrying with them every single day. Um, so I wanted this to be a place where we could, we could do that. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful, um, for all of you that were here tonight, um, whether you shared on voice, whether you shared, uh, in the chat, um, I'm, I, I, I cannot thank you enough for that. Um, cause that's, that's been a, um, uh, a, a very, very, um, big, big thing, I think. So, okay. I'm done rambling for a minute. I'm going to have a sip. I, I, I think tangenting back to what Andrea had said about how it, for her, it kicked off um her adhd somewhat i think that's part of what's most terrifying to me is that we as a society we minimize this we ignore this and the repercussions aren't i mean beyond the the initial the repercussions aren't small like untangling all of that down the line especially if you don't have the resources to untangle it well at the time it becomes a nightmare yeah 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 and i uh one of the huge things for me was doing emdr therapy with uh, it happened to be someone that that i already knew and so i didn't know that that's what she did and so we did emdr therapy 
I want to say it was that immediate weekend, but uh, a couple of weeks are a little bit of a blur. Um, and so I think that really helped get me off on the right foot of it was a lot of healing right away that was just immediate and needed. And I think that EMDR therapy, uh, for those that don't know, uh, EMDR, I think it's, it's rapid eye movement kind of stuff. I can't remember exactly what it, it stands for. Um, so it's a very simple therapy where you typically are holding, um, something in your hands and it will pulse back and forth. Um, it often mirrors like, an in and out of a wave or like um, uh, a one pulse in your one hand, one pulse in the other hand um, type of feeling. Um, and it's used a lot in therapy. So getting that attention right away uh, was extremely helpful in my therapy moving forward. Uh, I don't think I would have been able to process it. And I don't know what you want to call it as far as magic goes for that. But um, that is something that I felt getting the time right of was really important. Yeah, I think it's... It's tough to find something that works because, let's face it, the the human brain is, is a bucket of shit slapped inside, slapped inside of, of a skull, okay? Like, it's... it's the brain is terrible. It does some cool stuff, but it's also very, very badly designed. Um, it's a computer. Of course it's terrible. Yeah, computers computers were a mistake. Um, brains were a mistake. Brains were a mistake. But because of the way brains work, you know, not everything is going to, to work for everyone. Otherwise, we'd all be doing the same thing, and we'd all be okay. But that's just not the reality of it. Um, but I'm glad that there are so many different kinds of therapies that are out there. Um, you know, and I'm glad that you found something that, you know, that works for you. Um, and it's, it's like, you talk about, like, however the hell it works, you know, because, like, it's whatever magic it is. Um but it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, yeah, some of that's, and it's some can, of that stuff works for you. It may not work for somebody else, but again, that's why I'm glad there's so many different things out there that, you agreed. know, you can be tried that you can try. So, uh, and yeah, the EMDR, uh, was a, I think we did it three times over the course of a week. So it's not a maintenance thing. It was a, an immediate thing. Um, and it, well, it, it is based in science, so it's not um, something that is made up. It's like a very, it's a very accepted therapy practice, right? Like it's a very um, normal step in in trauma therapy. Um, but it does, it does just play off a lot of the, the coping mechanisms that I was taught later on, like um, taking your hands. And this is going to be really hard to explain, but. Um, Essentially, if you can, like, hook your thumbs and make, like, a little bird with it, and then it helps you, like, tap your chest. Or if you keep a rhythm on your chest, uh, I think this is it. And I'm trying to remember what I do exactly. It might be a little bit more of a, a crossed arm thing. And then uh, one hand, Zach, and then the other hand. So it's a thump, thump. Thumb to thumb like this. Uh, yep, you're right. And then um, do your left hand and then your right hand. Yep. Okay. Okay, now what do yeah, I do with flat my hands? On your chest. And just and do then it like this. Thump your, thump your left hand, your left um, arm or your left hand, and then your right hand. So one, 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 one. It like helps you. Yep, there we go. Yep, it helps you. And try and time it with like the beat of your heart, right? And it helps you kind of like recenter. Um, I don't always keep my thumbs hooked. I can kind of like open it up to get a b bigger beat, or sometimes I'll just keep the beat on my chest. And that reset is like part of a little bit. I think we talked about pre-show of like that being scattered and us being people who plan ahead. And if you're not worried about the thing that you're worried about, you're worried about the next thing. And that has a lot to do with presence for me and being present and making sure that when 
you feel like you're having a panic attack or unraveling, that beat can bring you back home. And that EMDR therapy is very similar in the way that it does that. So like next time you're feeling stressed, try it. And then it's interesting to feel how it brings you back to that like heartbeat centered breathing again. I use it. I, I have tactics for when I have panic attacks and that's a good one. Um, and that's why I, I like that therapy was helpful as like a piece. I also did immerse, immersive therapy, which I really hated because you have to tell your story on a tape and then listen to yourself tell a story like three times a day. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're right. There are mixes. Yeah, I was fixing to say like I know that at the program I worked at, some of the therapists did use EMDR. And so it was always interesting to me and it made me glad to see like even how some of my students would find small ways to do those things even like in the middle of class if they felt themselves you know getting worked up or anxious and so I think um like you said that being present you know grounded however you want to word that you know is so beneficial and I was I always thought EMDR was an amazing therapy um and so yeah that's really cool I actually have to think about that I've never seen the bird the yeah and bird. I, I'm not sure if I'm getting it 100% right but the idea is there and it helps but you're right like any small thing that you can do to bring yourself back really helps um and i will say if another therapist tells me that i need to do meditation i'm probably gonna scream but unfortunately like that's the right answer is that being present takes a lot of the anxiety and stress out of it and it doesn't necessarily have to be meditation in the way that we think of it um it can be meditation and i'm gonna think really hard about the way that this pencil feels in my hand or if I'm cooking, like take the time to slow down and think about what your hands are feeling and what you're smelling and what the, you know, it feels like on your skin. And that is a type of meditation that has calmed my brain a lot and I need to do more of. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of like, I had a student who would occasionally have flashbacks. And so something I learned with them is like when they're in that flashback, they aren't able to do that themselves. Um, so we would have to, I would go through the process of where are you right now? What are you touching? What are you smelling? What are you to try to bring them back to the moment? And, you know, it's, it's a skill that, you know, I think is really important. Um, no matter where you are with therapy. There's you know, a, a it practice may, too. It's, yeah. it's something that we should be all practicing in our tiny moments because it gives your brain a break from spinning and the way that our society is set up now with all of our phones and our technology and our devices is mm -hmm. our brain never stops spinning. So you have to take those little moments that you can find and make your brain shut up for five whole seconds because I think we all know that that's helpful. Right. There's there's a trick that I, I struggle hard with this association. Like I, I will just, mm -hmm. I, I have large holes in my memory from shit, but, um, so when I finally figured out that, oh, Hey, that's what's happening. Um, that I found, and I still don't know what the actual order is supposed to be, but it's supposed to be like a five, four, three, two, one. And it's like, I think it's like five things you're touching four things you're seeing or something like that. And I don't remember the order to this day. Mm -hmm. But not knowing the order is actually what I'll start focusing on that and be like, how am I supposed to figure out five things I can taste when I'm not eating anything? So I'll start figuring that out. And like, while that wasn't the original intent of the trick, that at least will like slow me down enough to like get myself out of whatever spiral I was previously in. Because I'll be sitting there being like, if it's five taste things and I have nothing in my mouth, like I can taste my teeth and like what else and like so it at least i'm not focusing on whatever is my issue at that moment i'm now focusing on you know what air tastes like which sounds ridiculous but it's actually really helpful but that i think makes... that's the point is it's the practice yeah. that is the important piece and al ali beth are you you're a crafter right yeah 
that's where I find that piece too. Of I'm gonna get mm -hmm. really focused in this hobby thing, and for at least an hour, I can say that I'm doing something productive or thinking about the taste of my mouth, and at least I'm not spinning out on everything else that exists in my life. Yeah, and for me, crafting is also like because I struggle with a lot of feelings of not being in control. Um, mm -hmm. And so I love crafting because it gives me that sense of I have control of something right now. And this is, um, you know, this is the thing that I can have control over right now. I can't have control over anything else, but I can have control of this. And actually, Elena, I was like thinking, I was just thinking about a therapist I used to work with and what you were doing was. <laughs> But, you know, by going through the process of what even is five things, you were you were turning on your rational mind, as she would say. Like you, and so it doesn't really matter if the process wasn't perfect. The, the fact that you got yourself from your irrational mind to your rational mind, like that, you did the thing. That's what you needed. So I I still use that. I this is this is an ongoing thing for me, and it's. It's just, what's funny is I will start to get annoyed and I'm like, okay, I'm now annoyed that I can't figure out what the, pro the, the, the pattern is supposed to be and how you can taste things when you're not eating anything. Okay, clearly <laughs> I've, I've jumped out of the, like, death spiral portion and now I'm in the, like, okay, now I have to, like, actually figure out how I'm going to deal with this. But I, I it, it's when I get annoyed at myself for not figuring out how I'm supposed to do it that I'm like, okay... We we've made it out of the to the whirlpool. Let like let's 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 move on now. I hear ya. Yeah, and how do you stop that spiral? Like, is it the activity of calming yourself down? Is it the activity of like thinking through that list? And then are there other other activities that do that too? Like, how do you stop that spiral? Because I am I am guilty of not being able to stop the spiral. Uh, like example today, I've been up since like super early, but I don't think I've gotten enough work done. And like, that's a spiral I know is coming. So how do you head that off? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I haven't done enough work in the last 16 months. Same. Ditto. Like, I just, it, yeah. And that, so far that is the only internal thing other than sleep that stops spirals like i i've been externally like jolted or guided or whatever out of them but so far that is the only like internal like sure thing other than sleep i i am lucky in that if i sleep i basically reset brain and mood wise mostly so I m might be horrendous the night before and I will wake up fine and it's extremely confusing to everyone but me. <laughs> so. But, you know, when it's 2 p.m. on a whatever day, you, you can't always just be like, okay, well, I need to give up the rest of the day and go to sleep, even though that would work. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have all this work to do. I'm going to sleep instead because I'm exhausted thinking about all this other shit that I have to do. <sighs> I mean, I don't I know. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I don't know how many times during a planning period, like, where I don't have kids, I'm like, can I get away with, like, crawling under this table and shutting my eyes for ten minutes? Because Absolutely. I just don't want to cope with anything else right now. Yeah. And for me, that's the super dangerous part about work freedom, too, is I'm by myself at home all day, and... I'm just trying to be okay, but I'm also trying to get work done, and I don't have those pressures. And so when it, the answer like could be, can I crawl into bed? It's like, well, you could, and it's like, oh, but you shouldn't. But I don't have kids <laughs> ever, so there's no, there's too much, there's a little bit of freedom there. Yeah, uh, which isn't great for me. Work, work from home has been a struggle for me because it was only me and my team for a while so whatever i got done was great and now even though it's mandatory for our entire team it's still not like they don't really have a high expectations of us because it's like one week in one week out and so what we can do from home what most people can do from home is so low 
that I'm just like, I know I could get more done. I, I But I have no sense of what normal or a good enough amount mm -hmm. is. And so it's just all over the place. And some weeks I, I think I'm doing fine. And some weeks I feel like are garbage. So I'm just, I have no idea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we went through similar things for like just the amount of work we're expected to do because we track all of our time as consultants and like we are just expected to do that and it's insane to get to an end of the day and it's like I'm making the decision whether I'm going to track my time or whether or not I'm going to keep my projects in the air and it's just so stressful all the time and I don't think they like that it's fully understood the damage that it feels like it's doing yeah to have those expectations so high and so ridiculous um, for teams, yeah. and I think there's just a benefit to giving people a little bit of space. Yep. Yeah. I feel like, I feel that way about education right now. Oh, I bet. Like, like we are pushing forward with doing all of the state testing. The state wants us to test them, just like it's a normal year, and I... I don't know how, I don't know that people really are fully realizing how traumatic this year has been for our kids. Like, yep. it's, it's not been easy. It's been back and forth. They've had no consistency. And for some, that's, you know, we talk about like situations where, you know, your abuser is someone you know. Well, for kids, a lot of times that's the person that's in the house with them. Mm -hmm. And so we think about how some of our kids have just been cooped up in their homes with their abusers where school used to be their escape from that. Uh, I mean, I know I was talking to our school psychologist and or social worker and, you know, she said they're, they're trying to put together resources to, cause they know like next year when we, I guess, get all these kids back in the building, you know, and kids, Trauma comes out as behavior, right? Because, you know, if you, th you adults don't even know how to handle trauma, kids even less so. And so that's where it comes out as behavior. And so how are we going to identify that and help them through that when I don't even know that people are fully realizing or validating that that's a thing for them? Yeah. And we're putting all the weight on lovely teachers who have been trying to do this this entire time and be flexible and, you know, move everything to being remote and yet are still asked to donate their money, their time and their energy in off hours to do stuff like this. It just we're asking so much and it doesn't make any sense anymore. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I just feel I feel bad, and I know that, like, I've gone through my own stuff just in addition to trying to teach this year, but, like, I know that I'm being asked to be flexible and to go through all these things and still cope with my stuff, and then the kids have to deal with my, the product of that. And some days that's not good, you know? They don't get the best version of me every day, and, you know, I don't know. It's, I know I need to validate my own self and, you know, all that good stuff, but I just also think about my kids all the time, you know? Of course you do. I mean, you picked this for a reason. You care about people, and it's, it has to be so hard to be in that position knowing all these people are hurting, and you're trying to keep yourself together, but you're also hurting. I mean, I think that was part of watching people go through this trauma is when I went, like, it's easier when you have support if you're the only one when we're collectively yeah. going through all of this the support systems underneath all of us are crumbling because we're built on a pyramid system of support and none of us are doing well right now no. um so the things i need and the people i normally turn to are trying their best to to keep themselves together and i think that's only going to be amplified when you put one adult in what 40 children in a classroom mm-hmm it's you know, I see next year being just another horrible year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I just, for my, you know, my fellow teacher friends, just, 
how traumatized they've been by this year. And it's not even just adjusting to remote. It's then having administration say, okay, well, you know, it's safe enough. We're going to put you back in the building and have, you know, however many kids in this classroom. And, you know, it's just... It's like you said, like, everybody's going through it right now. And you don't really know who to turn to. You can commiserate with a lot of people, but how do you get that support? I think and, we revolt you know, and demand a four-day four work week and universal health care and paying teachers millions of dollars. I mean, I'm for it. Yeah. <laughs> But, really? I mean, I used to work at a four-day school, and whoo, it was, you know, it was good to have that day, even, like, in a normal school year, to just breathe. Because um, mm -hmm. you don't get that over the weekends. You know, they say, oh, the weekend's your time off, but not when you're having to fit all of the things you can't do during the week. The adulting because... and being human stuff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that stuff. The stuff that used to be handled by an entire human that stayed home all day and did nothing but handle all those sh things, and now we're all so broke and so lowly paid that we all have to go to work, and there's no human at home to do our stuff, but we still have the same amount of stuff to do. Well, our labor yeah. can cut. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> right. I hear you. And I don't, I don't um, under, I think we're all, I think most of us are in a generation that are reaching a point of what the fuck, like, you're paying me less, you're giving me less, like, I have more shit to do. I think about things like technology management, like, my notifications are a mess because what if I have to, like, get off work and then go in and spend an hour configuring these things because I don't want my life to fall apart or, like, it to be annoying. That's a task, tax on my time. Uh, I think yeah. we just have a lot of those things now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, Allie, when you were talking about like just the, the stress of everything this year, you know, both on, on faculty staff and also on the kids, like, I can't help but think about a story that Sabrina told me a few weeks ago because she works in an elementary school and, um, you know, everybody's wearing masks at least still right now. Um, and um, all of the, the staff, faculty, you know, uh, district personnel, they all have photo ID badges. And one of her little kindergartners came up to her and looked at her badge and looked up at her face and goes, Miss Sabrina, is that what your face looks like? Like, in, like it, it struck Sabrina because here is this 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 kid that she's you know seen a good portion of the year she sees her almost every day at dismissal when the kids are all going home and this like she's come to realize this kid has never actually seen Sabrina's face in person cuz she's always had a mask on and like the the fact that this you know this is something that these kids are doing like that's that's like the the tiniest thing that these kids are dealing with, but the fact that like they don't necessarily know people's faces because they, you know, some of these people that they've never seen before, like the kindergartners, it's their first year at the school and they've never seen some of these people's faces before because they're not in a classroom with them necessarily. And you want to talk about like these kids that are in these, you know, terrible situations at home where they have some kind of abuser with them. Like, I, I can't imagine like the the like the humanity that these kids are missing just because of some of all this mm -hmm. kind of additional shit on top of it. Like it is heartbreaking well, to think about. Yesterday, yesterday, uh, me and another teacher we had lunch with the student, and they looked over at me and they were like, "You know, this is the first time I've ever seen your face," and I was like. Wow. Like, I've known this kid since January now. And they were like, I've never seen your full face before. Jesus. And, you know, it's just... 
it's, yeah, you know, and I think we take for granted how much of our communication is nonverbal. Yep. And yep, for sure. How, how from a young age, you know, I'm just thinking of, you know, my good old developmental psychology class, like, you know, from a young age, we start to pick up on that nonverbal and that's part of what develops our social cognitive abilities. And, you know, for our, you know, for Sabrina's little friend, like, you know, how is that going to affect her as she moves forward and tries to work on those social, you know, things? It's just... It has so many implications and so many things that just... It's going to be interesting to see kind of how we come out of this and what changes and how society is going to adjust. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear like what you think that impact will be. Like I don't spend a lot of time around children and the children I did spend time around or like have seen come out of this, there has been one that just hadn't been around people a whole lot because of the timing of their birth, right? Um, and so they yeah. would kind of stare at like people, right? And But the human brain is pretty good at adapting, especially when we're talking about like this amount of time mm -hmm. and that there probably were still faces around. They were just only mom and dad or whatever. Um, right. And I'm not saying, but I don't have that background of child psychology and understanding of what that impact could be. So is there a serious impact here or is there much and maybe these are two separate questions like more danger happening in other places where okay yeah there there were masks for a year and they may struggle with some like social cues because they haven't we haven't taught them those things but there are also like very abusive households where people are learning these behaviors as well that are even worse and so what's the impact and i i think you hit on it too like we probably won't know a hundred percent right Right. I just think about how the younger we are, the more our brain is what they call elastic. Basically, we are able to like it is like if you look at the psychology and the research and everything, it is mind boggling what a child learns at a young age. And that elasticity kind of, you know, wears away over time. And so I would anticipate we probably are going to have our younger kids who adjust and they get used to it and they figure it out because they still have that ability to process whereas i think our older kids you know i think of like how middle schoolers because right now i'm working with middle schoolers they can be very self-absorbed everything is me 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 right and we think about well they've been in isolating situations is that just going to compound that and leave more of a deeper imprint? I don't know, but I am concerned about the trauma because if you are at this point now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, confined in a space with your abuser, and we know that trauma affects your brain it it affects the way you process things it you know you you don't come out of trauma with your brain functioning the same way it did before what is that gonna look like for these you know younger individuals who are stuck in abusive situations with no idea of what doesn't look like an abusive situation you know what I'm saying? I just, yeah. I think about, you know, even working with some of the kids I've worked at before where they've gone through extreme abuse and trauma and they haven't got to the place where they can face it and deal with it. They start to, uh, you know, act their trauma out on other people. Mm -hmm. And I just worry about that too because that generates that cycle and unfortunately, I don't know that we have, you know, within education, like there's for my school, it's like, I think it's a K through eight. I think 
We have like six, between 600 and 800 students. We have one social worker. We have one social worker and one school psychologist, and that's it for probably 700 kids. Yep. And yeah. I know it's worse at the public schools. Or, I mean, I'm at a charter school, so technically it's public. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, here it's, you know, the high school. Like, I think about the high schools. The high, uh, An individual high school here has like 1,200 kids. And you know a high percentage of them. Because we've already identified these statistics are bullshit. So we already know a higher percentage of those kids are going through off things than what we even have an idea of and we have so few people to support them yeah and i just i mean it was here it, it was a problem before and i'm worried about the problem it further problem it's gonna become yeah i i am kind of scared for this group of kids like just I, I think there is a young enough age where what Ellie said about the elasticity will be more okay, but and I haven't verified the science on this, but I saw at one point um, studies that were being done kind of to compare um, low-income neighborhoods to high-income neighborhoods just for, for the kids for what happened, like what traumas happened near them. And there is such a strong correlation between ability to learn and like the stuff they were going through like they were yeah you know they were able to you know not 100 percent directly but like just having a murder happen in the area nearby was could could be correlated to like an effect on iq which there are issues with iq but that was just what they were trying to use to measure something so mm -hmm. while it's not a one-off sharp trauma necessarily the the pandemic is just a low um, a constant trauma and mm -hmm. in, in in various ways and so thinking about that study it's like what is that doing to their ability to learn to to their brains to to the basically the quality of education they'll take in whether the education is good or not are they going to take all of it in because of what they're yeah. going through. They won't. I mean, I it's really hard for me to explain to people like I literally can't learn in this environment. My job highly relies around me being able to learn a lot like uh very quickly and it changes all the time. Um but if my brain during all of this is 100% felt shut off, like I go to access anything learning and it just doesn't happen. There have been mm -hmm. breaks in that when I am less stressed or freaking out or my brain just does the whole, I'm shutting down now, good luck. Um, and then I find that I can read and I have more open availability for that brain to be able to take in information. But explaining that to people who don't understand what that feels like and the difference um, or could recognize it means that you're right. People don't, these kids aren't, no one should be learning or trying to do anything right now, I feel like for the past year. Yeah, it's well, and I think it also like people talk about learning loss um, and I'm like, oh, our kids are falling behind. Everybody's behind. Behind no. what? That's my question. Yeah, like nobody's uh, like we're all on the same page, you know, like just just cool it with that because really honestly when people say oh our kids are falling behind what they're really saying is oh we just don't want our kids at home so you can deal with you know what i'm saying it's just or we've designed a system to test these kids that doesn't actually test anything and we're trying to hide behind it so now we don't really have a choice because if we gave people the space during all of this to to do things like create or paint or uh just have that space as kids we would come be coming out with a generation that has much better feet under them than they started and we didn't do that and i think we screwed them in that yeah so this is this has been a a fantastic um discussion however unfortunately it is 10 o'clock eastern and that means we are out of time for tonight 
Um, before we cut away, though, um, uh, for those of you on voice, did y'all have any final thoughts? No, thank you for hosting this wonderful event. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you being here, Andrea, uh, and being able to share your story and your insights with everyone. Um, this is, I, I think we had a really, really good discussion tonight. Um, and thank you to both of you, Elena and Allie Beth, for being on call with us. Um, for those you of you, you are welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, for those of you in the chat, um, thank you so much. For those who, you know, who felt that they could come forward and share their stories, thank you. Thank you again. Um, I know that's that's an incredibly difficult step to take, um, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I'm, yeah. Oh. Well, thank you for being open and vulnerable as well. Because yep. that takes a lot. Um Yeah, I think I think tonight we had a we had a very a very good and productive discussion. Um so I'm 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 just glad that we you know, we were all able to, to talk tonight, so um Okay. So, um Group therapy will be again next Wednesday. Uh, we don't have a topic for next Wednesday yet. Um, probably won't have one. We'll probably have just like another open discussion night like we usually do. Um, Friday, we'll be back with the fork and knife in and um, doing the pew pews. Um, nah. Elena, are you going to do the pew pews with us? Uh, yes. Yeah, I you are. Play. I don't have <laughs> levels to get. That's Hello. true. You do. It's true. It's true. Ooh, um, I hit 52 tonight. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, Sunday, we're going to do our usual Sunday shenanigans, playing Minecraft Dungeons, so that should be all the funs, um, especially now that we've unlocked the Mushroom level and we can do the power leveling, so that should be a lot of fun. And also, it doesn't hurt that Elena can one-shot the, the, the boss at the end, so, you know, it's fine. Um, let's see. What else? Um, next Monday, um, I had, it was, it was ridiculous and my brain was overloaded and it's still a tiny bit overloaded from this past Monday. Um, but boy, howdy, am I going to play the Final Fantasy 14? So I guess, I guess MMO Mondays is going to be a thing now, huh? Monday. 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 Combo breaker. Um... So, yeah, so we'll be back to that on Monday. But, yeah, Fortnite Friday night happy hour this Friday, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. Um, hope to see you. Yeah, bun of us. I'm not a bun. I'm an elf. Don't you forget it. Um, uh, but, yeah, um, see you all on Friday. Um, I think tonight we're just going to... We're just gonna call it a night. Um, it has been it has been wonderful. Um, I, I again thank you all. This I, I could not have done this without all of y'all being here and um, being so um, you know open and and able to talk about your stuff and, and provide some really great discussion. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and again thank you, Andrea, for being here and and providing us with your experience and expertise. I um, love you. This was great. I love you more. Um, no. All right. So y'all be good to each other. Um, and uh, we will see y'all Friday night for the Fork Knives. Until then, take care. Bye. <laughs>